All right, let's roll right into three more movies in my continuous quest to check up to 2021 releases. Um, let's start with the movie everybody was clamoring for, which is another Purge movie, our fifth one, if I'm counting correctly. Um, so the first one, we had the one where everybody thought they misused the concept, and they're like, oh, it's a great concept, but all you did was make a home invasion movie, and then he, James DeMonica, the creator and the writer and the director of three of them, uh, the first three, said he wanted to do an Escape from New York thing if he got kind of a bigger budget next time, because that's, he was working with a small budget, and that's why the first movie was the way it was, and then he got bigger and bigger, and then the third movie, of course, ended with the... Um, abolishing of the Purge, uh, which is a pretty fit ending and a pretty secure ending. But they're like, well, no, we kind of got to keep this going. So, uh, yeah, of course, they got the whole TV show thing going on, too. But as far as movies go, they're like, well, why don't we do a, uh, a prequel and we'll do how this whole thing started and we'll do the first Purge, which came out and was like, all right, fine. Um, and that one actually wasn't too bad. I thought it had a couple of interesting characters in it, like Skeletor and stuff like that, uh, which made it fun enough, even if it was obviously really, really, really running out of gas. Um, and they, they were already crossing the line into cringe territory by the third one with the fucking candy bar girls and shit. Um, but, um, yeah, and then the prequel happens, and it's like, okay, now there is nowhere to go. Now, we have seen where it started, we've seen where it ended. Let's... Let's stop now. Uh, and they're like, no, we got another, uh, we got another little development here. How about um, we decide to start breaking the rules? And it's like they decide to go past the siren. They decide to just keep going. It's like, like day after day after the purge is supposedly over, they just keep going. Uh, and I believe a lot of people's response to that was so just a regular crime slash horror movie that really has no bearing on the concept at all. Um, I guess the only difference is the, I suppose it's pretty much become iconic at this point when you see people in, like, really interesting, freaky-looking masks or whatever, um, you, you consider it purge-like. Um, so I, I guess it's got that going for it, but, um, it's, we're, we're really, really running low now. Uh, and to my understanding, apparently they're already thinking about a sixth one already, so there's that. Um, and as far as this one goes, and going past that concept, one thing, um, that I thought was a little needlessly added to this was, uh, you've got the whole idea of people, people going past, like, that's the thing, is they've, we go through the whole process of the Purge has now been brought back, um, because, which, maybe it's, maybe they're trying to say, because they're trying to say everything. Uh, so, <laughs> these these movies are not subtle at all, but they've never been, so I don't feel like there's any reason to go much into that. Um, it's very clear what these movies are saying, because they plaster the entire movie with neon signs that say exactly what they're trying to say about today's political climate and all that. And maybe with the return of The Purge, after it was abolished, is them saying something about, like, the way government seems to progress and then regress and so on. Maybe, but I feel like there's a whole step we could have skipped here where you had the whole idea of what the Forever Purge is right there, where instead of doing the whole, oh, the Purge has been reinstated, so now literally the entire first 25 minutes of the movie is exactly like any other Purge movie, where we're waiting for the time to come around, Everybody's preparing. In the meantime, we're doing these stupid little jump scares that have nothing to do with anything, which have basically become a serious trademark at this point. Um, but being a serious trademark does not equal a good thing. Um, where it wants to remain a horror movie before The Purge, so they just have random people pop out and the soundtrack will scream at us or hit something really loud or something. Um, and ju just to throw in that, even though there's nothing there to warrant that whatsoever, it's in, it's in all of them. Uh, the pre-purge moments of each movie. Um, and then we go through all the characters, none of which we're going to care about in this one. They, I don't even remember their names. Um, I, I, was only having, I was only able to go by actor. Uh, Josh Lucas and Will Patton are in there. Um, Hansi Den from Fargo Season 2 was in there. Um, but not, not really much to go on character-wise and who was motivated. One of them is pregnant. 
simply for the fact that that's a character trait, uh, pretty much. Um, and then, yeah, then the purge happens, and then the purge is over, and then our story happens where people are still going. Um, I feel like there's, that's a whole 20 minutes devoted to that, when if you, if your concept is people playing outside the rules and going against it, why not just immediately start the movie right off of election year, the third movie, where the purge has been abolished, and it's just people continuing to purge even though the purge has been abolished. That's, that's like a whole section you could have taken out of this and devoted to that. But instead, we're so out of ideas, we have to do the first 25 minutes of the movie exactly the, way, the same way we do every time, and then there's only like an hour or less left um, to just do whatever with the concept to make people purge outside the lines. Um, so immediately it feels like a flawed concept to begin with, and like it's overcomplicating itself when it could have... But that's the thing is, if it had more ideas, it probably could have immediately started with the Forever Purge and just gone from there. But we, we don't have any ideas because we're running out because there's too many of these now, and there's only so much you can do with this to begin with. Um, they were almost, they were pretty much pushing it with a third movie. Uh, let alone a prequel, uh, TV series, and now this one, and a potential sixth one. And by, by, by the middle of this one, I would just really, I just really didn't give a fuck. Like, this, <laughs> this, this movie did not really stick with me in any way whatsoever. And it's kind of, because it was kind of cool, um, like, in the first, like, in the first movie when you had um, um, Reese Wakefield outside and he's doing his whole thing and it's the whole home invasion aspect and then and people are getting killed in like, you know, bizarre ways and there's like, you know, Manson-esque girls out there, there's people with machetes, there's all this, all this teases of stuff we didn't quite see. Um, and then there's a big climax where people start getting shot and stabbed and all that. And then there's the second movie that kind of pulled an Aliens approach, where it was like, if the first one was more horror and thriller, um, we're going to go pure action movie for our sequel. So we have Frank Grillo and everybody, and there's a lot of guns going off. And that's what a lot of the second movie was, because the second's basically an action movie, so it was fitting. It was kind of a cool little uh, twist in kind of a different direction, uh, where like the, the whole feel was kind of a little bit different. Um, but, and probably cooler. Um, and now, by the time we've gotten to this point, all the action is still just shooting and guns going off. And it's like, it feels like there should be a bit more... Like, there was, like there's the scene, I think it's in the third movie, when they, like, drive by an alleyway, and there's just a giant, like, guillotine being used. And it's like, that's what you kind of think was all the different sort of creativity or whatever. Not, not, even, not, not even necessarily creativity, um, but just really surreal imagery, um, in the backdrop of this otherwise normal city that for these 12 hours is just this insane. Um, and just none of that is here anymore. It's just all really tired. A lot of the actions, like, in, a lot of the actions in the dark, which is, makes sense because that 12 hour period is at night usually, but now you get to play with the whole thing of the purge just going on forever. Um, just at any time it wants to. So we can, we get to see the purge in the daylight. We get to see the purge go multiple days over. Um, but that is still nothing feels new. Mo I, like, most of my memory of the movie is things happening in the dark, mostly people getting shot. Um, and it keeps switching up villains. Like, every, like I was talking about Reese Wakefield in the first movie, and you had, like, Skeletor in the prequel and stuff like that. Um... And, like, it, I feel like the Persian movies work better when they have that one continuous villain that keeps popping in and out. Um, that's consistent until we get to the end, to give it some sort of climax. Um, but this one in particular is really egregious about how it just jumps from one antagonist to the next. Um, which doesn't really give it any sort of cohesive feel. Like, that's kind of, I feel like that's the idea of having, like, one villain that keeps coming back until the climax is there's, it adds some sort of cohesion to it to make it all feel like a thing, and then, like, we're headed towards one particular climax. Um, but here we're just literally going from, here's one person established as a threat, then here's another one, then here's another one, and then we just kind of stop. Unceremoniously. Uh, until we get to a certain point, and... There's developments here and there, 
Um, but they're not really in any way, like, engaging or make you think, like, you know, what's going to happen next or we have to get from point A to point B. Because um, it's just hopping around anyway. Like, it doesn't really, it didn't really matter one way or the other if they had some sort of objective to get one place to the other. Um, because the characters could do that by themselves, but um, just nobody, nobody stands out as a character. Like, not even, you know, antagonists. There's not even, like, cool-looking antagonists. Um, it's just generic fucking people. But much like the heroes of the story. They're just all generic fucking people. Um, that only have the slightest little distinguishments, like, you know, one's pregnant or Josh Lucas is racist. Um, but, but the way they set that up, of course, like, Josh Lucas's character in particular is that extremely... He, he, he goes about a character arc in the most predictable way possible, and pretty much at the time where we just really don't give a shit if this character has an arc or not. Um, it's just... Yeah, and as far as, like, everything feeling tired as far as the Purge concept and how everything looks aesthetically and, you know, like the, like the costumes or the masks or the ways people die or whatever, um, there's... It's the beginning when we first realize that the people are going to continue purging anyway. Um, one of our main characters, or one of our hero characters, gets caught in what is absolutely 100% a saw trap. So we're just we're just going in that territory now. We're just <laughs> it's like we're, when you run out of ideas, use a steal from a franchise that in itself is already running out of ideas, and that's where we are. That's that's what happens. Um, so, yeah, and, and as far as, like, um, the the Purge sequence itself, like, before the Forever Purge is happening, um, it's, you know, the like, the opening credit sequences of the other movies where we just kind of see it on security cameras or from a distance, stuff like that? It, that's that's what it is. That's all they do. So it's basically like we're... It's, it's especially sped through, which makes it all the more weird that they didn't just start it at... The purge has been abolished. People are gonna keep going. We had to go through the whole thing of it being reinstated first. Um, so, you know, whatever. Uh, and as far as it being, you know, saying all these blatant statements, if you want to call it that, as far as like the current political climate and stuff like, that, like I said, it's not like the movies have ever been subtle about that ever. Like that's that's kind of their whole point is how unsubtle they are about that. Um, but still, it's the case where, like, the fact that it's not even trying to be clever about it, um, where it's like you, you, like, you could see them doing this, but it's almost like, if it was more, like, smart and subtle, wouldn't it be more, wouldn't the satire of it be more biting, um, as opposed to just, like, flat out saying, hey, this... <laughs> Um, but it's, but it's, it doesn't seem interested in doing that at all. Like, it's all about making everything as blatant and obvious as possible. Um, which I guess is more, is, is staying in line with what they've been doing. Um, but I would have liked to have seen it have, like, more teeth in regards to what it's going after. Um, but it's, it, it's almost like it's pussying out by just saying, hey, this is this. Um, without doing it in some sort of clever way, so which I think would have been, you know, <laughs> uh, more more effective and more uh, insulting to whatever aspect they'd be going after. Um, but they but they never reach that because they're just too focused on being as obvious as possible about themselves. Um, and then yeah, the rest like the whole middle section is just a bunch of boring action. Uh, that could be in any movie. It, d it didn't have to be a Purge movie. It could have been any movie that this was. Um, and it would have been just as forgettable. So, that's... And, like, I mean, every now and then we get shots that kind of show off, like, the chaos and the way you kind of want to see in movies. Like, like, when we started to really see the outside in Anarchy, the second movie, um, and how that contrasted with the confined nature of the first movie, it seemed really like, like the chaos was everywhere, and it was, like, all-consuming. We get, like, one, like, really distant shot of, like, the full city, and we see, like, a water tower falling over, and you kind of see the chaos for, like, a second. Um, but overall, it's just all the same tired shit with no real impact whatsoever. There's no, like I said, there's no standout masks or costumes or anything like that. Certainly no standout antagonists. Um, 
so that's that's pretty much it. So basically, we're just kind of waiting for Josh Lucas to get some sort of redemption because he's racist, <laughs> and uh, that that girl's probably gonna have her baby at some point in the most inconvenient time, probably towards the climax, um, to add pretty much no tension whatsoever. So there's that. Um, and yet to basically come to a conclusion that's just relatively open. It doesn't feel very closing in any particular way, which, like I said, the, the concept itself basically already did away with that anyway. But on top of the fact that you don't even have, like, some sort of primary antagonist, which would have at least felt it kind of sealed it up a little bit on its way out. But um, that is not the case. It's just here, and it's a fucking mess but not in the cool way, like Anarchy was. <laughs> um, it's just it's just here because this franchise refuses to die. So um, that's that's it. There's really nothing else to really say about it. So that's it's just here existing to nobody's real amusement or entertainment or whatever. It just exists. So, let's go in a completely different direction, and let's go to Soderbergh's new movie, which is No Sudden Move. Soderbergh's movie with a really big cast, and it's a crime movie. So it almost feels like we're going back to sort of classic Soderbergh. Uh, cl classic crime Soderbergh, I said. There's so many different Soderberghs, <laughs> which is amazing. Um, but here, where he's kind of got that slickness to him, but not only does it feel like classic crime Soderbergh, but classic crime movie in general, where it's got, like, the old-style opening, and it's set in, like, 1954, I think. Um, and it has the feel of one of those old-fashioned crime movies from the time. Like, like, well, I struggle to say noir, but no, I guess it'd be right around that area. Um, but going into this, um, I couldn't help but hear some things going in. I didn't know anything about the plot or the developments or anything like that. But I heard that a lot of people had trouble getting into it because they thought that it was not only, like, all over the place, but apparently, like, sort of three different movies happening. And when I, when I think of, like, one movie that's, like, three movies, which is what I was hearing about this, uh, a couple of movies come to mind. And both of them, I think, very possibly of, possibly of for that reason. Uh, Dead Presidents is the first one that comes to mind. Um, where, like... It starts off and it introduces the characters, and it seemed like it might be sort of a character drama. Then the second part of it is a war movie, where they go to Vietnam, and then the third movie is the aftermath, where it's a heist movie. And it's like, I love that structure, and I love that movie. And another one that comes to mind is another movie with Ray Liotta, who is also in this. Um, the Place Beyond the Pines is very famously basically three movies in one. Um, but once again, that was the whole thing where it was Gosling's story, then it was Bradley Cooper's story, then it was Dane DeHaan's story, um, where it was a one, two, three structure, and I kind of get where some people think this is the kind of the same thing, um, but it's, it's kind of not really, like, I, it seems more so like if you would say this is three movies in one, it's one movie and then two movies happening simultaneously, basically. Uh, but even that feels like a stretch, for the most part. And I don't know if it's because I went in thinking that, that the movie felt much more cohesive to me than it apparently did for a lot of other people. Um, that could be the case. So so this is one case where it's like, if you know at least a little bit going in, it might actually help. Um, despite the fact that the way it unravels is what makes the movie so interesting, for the most part. Um, and when we start off, we've got a really incredible start here that really shows off the cast well which is we have three criminals who are brought together for this one job, three criminals being Don Cheadle, Benicio Del Toro, and Kieran Culkin, with Cheadle kind of basically being the center of the movie, basically. It's, it's very much an ensemble piece. Um, but they are given a job by Brendan Fraser. Um, Brendan Fraser looking very different, looking very... He's, ri he's he's big in this way, like, physically big in this way, to where he's, like, when you... Because when you think of Brendan Fraser, you wouldn't think intimidating character. At least I wouldn't. <laughs> um, but there's something about his presence, like, his, his physical presence and the way he interacts with the characters where, yeah, it turns out Brendan Fraser can play intimidating very well. There's even a moment where he's only on the phone. Like, we only hear him screaming from the other side of the phone, and you can feel the intimidation in the room. 
of how how scared of this guy these people are. These these career criminals that have already seen shit. <laughs> um, this guy is a very intimidating figure. Um, and he's the one that's kind of setting this up. And they have to go to David Harbour's house um, for a reason that will eventually unfold. And this whole sequence in David Harbour's house could have been an entire movie. Uh, and it would have been a great one. Uh, because we've already established so many characters at this point and so many different personalities that are clashing and these three criminals that are coming from totally different places um, and and have their own things going on that are going to unravel in their own ways and go in all these different... It's a whole web of characters here um, that all have their really interesting things going on, which is one of those things also where it kind of adds to the unpredictability of the movie because not only are you unaware of what's exactly going to happen next or what surprise is going to happen next, but you're never entirely sure which character we're going to follow next either. Um, like, when one scene ends, it's up in the air of who we're going to cut back to and then go in that direction, um, which is really fun. And, and, a, and a great way to use an ensemble, because when you have ensemble movies like this, there's typically so many cast members that end up getting wasted and just kind of come in for a scene or two. They may leave an impression in a scene or two, but overall it feels like it's certain characters are the focus, and then there's a bunch of background characters. But this one, it feels like you never know uh, who we're going to start following and how that's going to circle back around to whichever character we're going to go to after that, even. Um, and it's so much fun. I was, <laughs> I was really into this for the most part. I will say, um, th I don't think the first half is as, or I, I think the first half is much more entertaining and engrossing than the second half. Um, but it's, there's still something there that keeps you going, I said keeps going from character to character. And I think one thing that makes the first half um, stronger than the second is, while he's throughout the movie, the first half in particular has a lot of focus on David Harbour and... This might be... I've, I've been praising David Harbour for a while. Like I, I Obviously, I like to say that... Uh, I was praising David Harbour long before Stranger Things. I'm, I'm a David Harbour, hip, David Harbour hipster, basically. <laughs> um, and it's... This might be the best performance that he's given um, in his pretty lengthy career. And that's saying something, because he has always come in and left him... Even his small scene in Brokeback... Um, he left, like, a really big impression and like, Revolutionary Road and stuff like that, and then all the way to now. Um, hitting stuff like, you know, Black Mass in between there. Um, and... But what he does here is so... award-worthy, first off. I can't see this being an awards movie, but if it was, um, he should be... I know we're only halfway through the year, but this is, like... It's probably my favorite performance of the year so far, is David Harbour in this. Um, and he has, like, there's a certain level of dark humor to it, but there's also such a franticness to it, but he also throws in these little subtle things. His, his last line in the movie is my favorite line in the movie, <laughs> and, it, and it has to do with his delivery also. Um, and it really sums up his character, too. And it's like, it's really just these little moments, even though his character is kind of so big and, like, really frantic and like he's constantly running out of time through the whole movie still just these little moments just constantly creep in um that are amazing there's one moment in particular where he's getting ready to punch somebody and his his dialogue leading up to that and just the whole you know concept of the scene is um i just love i loved everything about david harbour in this movie and like i said in an ensemble this good um, with all these characters getting to shine, you have to do a lot to stand out in a crowd like this, in a movie like this, and I would go as far as to say this is David Harbour's movie. Um, even though, um, like I said, che Cheadle's played up like the main character, with Del Toro kind of right behind him, um, but I, I walk away from this movie thinking about David Harbour, and <laughs> So, um, what that, whatever that tells you. And then, we've also got a lot of characters that shine, but they don't always have to be on screen to do that. Because another thing, talking about, like, the classic feel of it, and, like, the sort of, like, the somewhat noir feel of it, where a lot of those movies have characters that are talked about, um, but that don't actually have a lot of screen time. So they're kind of built up through the whole movie, and then they eventually come into it. 
and there's two characters like that here. The crime boss is played by Ray Liotta and um, Bill Duke. Um, and that in itself kind of, like, they both definitely have a great presence and a, a huge factor when they're actually in the movie. But like I said, the, the way they're so built up to feels like the, you know, the antagonist of really classic crime movies like that from, like, the 40s. Um, and like I said, that, that just adds to the whole, you know, web of characters and the complexity of it. Like I said, if you, if you go into it prepared for complexity, then it doesn't feel as overcomplicated as it might seem uh, to somebody who just kind of goes into it blind or completely blind. Um, and once again, of course, um, Soderbergh shot this himself uh, under his cinematographer pseudonym or whatever. Um, and there's a, there's, there is something here about um, the, uh, the fisheye technique that he uses where it's like, I can see a lot of people watching this and thinking like, something is wrong, like there was some transfer that went wrong or something because of this. Um, but it does kind of feel like an almost, um, like it's sort of, the, it's kind of hard to describe, um, sort of the way you're looking into the movie as a spectator, um, it kind of feels almost like voyeuristic in a sense, especially with some of the more confined settings, um, and how the way you're sort of watching it unravel in a way almost like uh, almost like you're watching something like the conversation or something where like every new teeny tiny detail um is going to take us in a whole other direction um and it is one of those cases though where it's not like it's not heading to some big huge climax or confrontation and that might end up putting some people off like when it reaches its destination it's more like it just kind of knifes you and leaves you for dead as an audience member. Um, and and I can really appreciate that also, uh, especially in a particular context like this. Um, to where, w when it's all said and done in retrospect, um, it's it's almost kind of not surprising given the, uh, the movie's sort of attitude or essence uh, all the way up to this point. It's like, yeah, that's about where I should have expected this movie would leave me. <laughs> so... Um, you know, so like I said, that, that second half isn't quite as enticing as the first half. Um, but the, like I said, the way it unravels and the way each character kind of gets this in order to shine, big or small, uh, and you're never quite sure which path we're going to go down next, um, is really, really engrossing in a way that I wish more movies like this were. But, um, and that's, uh, and if, it feels like one of those things that we couldn't have probably gotten if not. For so, like, if it had not been a Soderbergh movie, it wouldn't be... We wouldn't be able to have huge casts like this in movies like this, which is really, really exciting. Um, so, and it's it's always interesting. To see, you, you really seriously never know what the hell Soderbergh is going to do <laughs> from one movie to the next, which is another case where it's like, you, you love the directors that we have where we kind of get a sense of the vibe their next movie is going to be, and we can look forward to that and seeing that director do that director's thing. Um, and then there's the Soderberghs of the world, um, where you just have no idea what the hell to expect from one movie to the next. Uh, and it's really super... Even as, even as ones that don't land, it's like you can just really appreciate the way he goes from one movie to the next, and you never have no idea what to expect. Whether the, the style, there is... And like I was saying, there's obviously a clear Soderbergh style to an extent, but there's so many different Soderbergh styles. Right? You can see three different movies with three different styles all by Soderbergh and you can tell they're him even despite how different they are it's it's fucking crazy so um yes um so I was very much into uh No Sudden Move but it's I guess it kind of depends on the person I guess know the person you're talking to before you recommend it um cause people may really really take to this or they may not be able to get into it much at all especially with the different ways it unravels might be kind of jarring, but um, I was really into it, so yes. Um, so let's end this one on the Hitman's Wife's Bodyguard, which is... But, uh, okay, so my opinion of Ryan Reynolds is very, very clear if you've been watching anything I've ever done on this channel. Um, like, it's to the point now to where I'm... Uh, I'm as tired of complaining about Ryan Reynolds as I am tired of Ryan Reynolds. So, <laughs> so just it's Ryan Reynolds doing his Ryan Reynolds thing. I'm not a fan of that. Let's see what else the movie has. 
it, it did seem like the movie was doing me a favor. It was very kind of bizarre. Um, I felt like Ryan Reynolds spends at least 50% of this movie unconscious. So, points for that, I suppose. But, um, because obviously, if you, the star of the movie they're trying to do is uh, Salma Hayek, of course. And it was interesting reading up on this, and it's like how... You know, when she was, like, really thrilled to go into this because she was given, like, a lot of creative control and basically they were saying, like, you know, any ideas you have, throw into this. And it was, like, so it really got, this was really a chance for Selma Hayek to feel like she had this movie and had so much say in it um, and could have real control in the directions it would go um, while, was, while still being uh, directed by Patrick Hughes, the director of the first movie. Um... And what's interesting about this one is after the events of the first one, he's like in, Brian Reynolds is like in therapy now because of Jackson, and he's still haunted by the the dude that Jackson killed that he was supposed to protect that, you know, fucked up his whole bodyguard thing in the first movie. This is stuff I probably wouldn't have remembered if not for the fact that the whole movie recaps it, so, and I, did, I didn't feel a need to revisit the first one, because like, I have, they'll probably do the recap thing. Uh, these are not the kind of movies that trust their audience, so, <laughs> for, and in this case, um, for the better, I guess. But, um, interestingly, though, um, after he's basically forced to go on vacation, naturally, we get, we get the inevitable scene of he's, you know, zoned out, he's listening to music, and he's relaxed while there's gunfire and shit behind him. I believe that was in the first movie as well, as well as every fucking movie ever. Um, and, because Ryan Reynolds just had to do the same thing every fucking time. But um, the gunfire is from Selma Hayek, who has to help uh, Jackson now. It's the reverse of what the first movie was. Um, and so now he's already in it. And then we introduce Frank Grillo, um, who is this cop that kind of sets up the whole mission of what they're supposed to do throughout the movie. Um, and what's really interesting about that is it basically feels like we're coming, we're starting at the end of a movie where Frank Grillo's character was the hero. And we're like continuing from there. Um... And it turns out we have a new villain in Antonio Banderas, uh, which is very exciting. It's also worth noting that Patrick Hughes, the director, uh, took over for The Expendables 3. And a lot of people hated The Expendables 3 because it was like PG-13 and toned down. Um, I'm of the controversial opinion. I think The Expendables 3 was my favorite of those. And my favorite part of The Expendables 3 was Antonio Banderas. So I was really psyched about him being the villain in this. And the, the idea of him reuniting with Selma Hayek, because, like, whenever, no matter what the context, whenever Antonio Banderas and Selma Hayek are on screen together, some kind of magic is going to happen. So, it at least has that to fall back on, um, whenever it get, <laughs> whenever it's, like, really, really running out, which is most of the time. Um, so, as far as this being, like, Selma Hayek's show, basically, um, I am, I'm absolutely all for her getting, like, you know, taking the sequel to a movie and making her the main focus of it and getting her to do her whole thing. Um, I don't know if this was... It's, it's, as far as her being, like, very uh, proud to be the center of this, um, I don't know because it's... it's I would say it's weaker than the first movie, but the first movie's not really all that either. Um, this is this is the weirdest thing to be trying to be a franchise. Um, like it just feels so unmemorable, and who gives a fuck uh, that it's that it's really trying to do this franchise thing with it. But um, obviously, there's one particular joke at its center, and that is shock surprise. Samuel Jackson says "motherfucker" a lot. Once again, Ryan Reynolds bringing in all the brand new shit like he always does. So, um, now we're transferring that over to Selma Hayek, who is going to be saying motherfucker constantly, along with Samuel Jackson, who's still here saying motherfucker constantly. So there's most of your dialogue. And if you think that's the most hilarious thing ever, that these maybe that's what you come here for. Clearly, when you go to a, Ryan's Reynold, a Ryan Reynolds movie by choice... You're probably there to see Ryan Reynolds do his Ryan Reynolds bullshit. Um, and you can say the same thing about Samuel Jackson, but at least Samuel Jackson is, like, inherently entertaining and in anything. Like, he can elevate literally anything. He's been elevating shit since he started acting. <laughs> he's been doing it for decades. He's been in so much shit that he's always the best part of. And he's also often the best part of shit 
that's great in total, <laughs> um, there's hardly a wrong he can do, apart from many of his choices, because he's just in everything. Um, which unfortunately results in him being in shit like this multiple times over if there's more than one. Um, and when he brings his motherfuckers in, you know, it's, yeah, that's what we're here for, okay. Um, I don't know, I, I love Samai, by the way, she's incredibly talented, has a great, um, presence in general, she can do drama, she can do action, she can do comedy, it's, it's, she can do everything. Um, but I don't know if she has the motherfucker timing that Samuel L. Jackson does. Because when you've got the master of motherfuckers saying motherfucker constantly throughout this movie, um, some hike over here, when she says it, it's never, it always feels forced. I can't think of one natural motherfucker that came out of her, and she's saying a lot of them. Um, and I, it's one thing that the timing just kind of seems off, and that she can't quite do it to Jackson's degree, but when you actually have Jackson here doing it as well, that's only going to highlight that even more. Yes, only talking about a Samuel Jackson movie can you spend like five minutes on just how people say motherfucker. That's, yeah, this is what you're here for, I guess. Um, I was joking. I was joking when this movie got announced, because in the first movie there's that opening scene with a very, very coked out Richard E. Grant that Ryan Reynolds has to protect. And that's the opening scene to kind of establish his character. And when this movie was announced, I joked, if Richard E. Grant doesn't come back, I'm not interested. Well, I was very surprised, because the movie has an opening credit sequence, so I learned quickly that Richard E. Grant is in this, and his character does come back. Um, I think if he hadn't been in something as big as a Star Wars movie and just gotten an Oscar nomination, I don't think Richard E. Grant would have been in the opening credits of this movie because he's there for like a fraction of a second. He doesn't get much to do at all. He's basically there to establish somewhat of a problem that isn't really that much of a problem. In the long run, it just goes into another action scene. Um, and then he's gone. I was kind of hoping we could have expanded on him a little bit. But uh, no, he, he, it's just a cameo. Don't be fooled by the opening credit he got. So that's kind of a bummer. But um, if there is one thing I can say about this movie... Um, and both these movies, really, it's that even though I don't care for Ryan Reynolds doing his Ryan Reynolds thing, and even though it just goes from one action scene to the next, or one comedy bit to the next, none of which are really landing that much, um, this movie is extremely high energy in a way that's surprisingly not annoying. Like, I was able to notice, like, it's really... Like, there's a lot of tired shit in the movie, like jokes and stuff like that, and Ryan Reynolds in general. But the movie's never boring. Like, it's constantly doing something because it's so incredibly energetic. Um, so props to the direction on that. Um, and the fact that despite the fact that it's basically just a broad comedy at the end of the day, there's a very, very fucking stupid flashback scene that shows why Reynolds' character basically wants to be a bodyguard and why he's so protective, obsessed with seatbelts, stuff like that. Um, and it's just a stupid comedy at the end of the day, but the, they really commit to the violence also. Like, the violence is, like, really hard-hitting when it's there for the kind of movie that it is. So that, on top of the energy of it, it's like, okay, that's something that it's doing. It's just the content of the movie itself. Like, the, the style is there, um, and, like, doing something right. Um, but it's just the inner workings of the movie itself that aren't giving it anything to amplify. Uh, it's like, it's the energy's doing all the work by itself, but, like, at the end of the day, it's still like, oh, but there's still nothing. Like, there's no... There's no one standout action scene, and there's no one standout comedy bit. It's just all the standard shit from beginning to end. Like, nothing stands out at all. Like, not even one aspect of it. Um, except maybe the Antonio Banderas scenes, but they're neither action-packed nor extremely comedic. Um, it's just kind of Banderas' presence in general, especially when he's reunited with Hayek, um, is really fun to watch. But, yeah. Um, and then we add another character... And, I, I mean, I should have known right away because of the opening credits, and he's on the poster and stuff like that. They put Morgan Freeman in this movie. But I was thinking, like, you know, what exactly are you going to do with Morgan Freeman in a movie like this? Um, and so they do this joke where they build up that 
Brian Reynolds is going to go home to his dad. Uh, and they're really, really, really building up his dad. Um, his dad, who is another bodyguard, like a really famous high-end bodyguard, like the, the highest of the high in bodyguard status. And as we were building up to this, a thought crossed my mind of, wouldn't it be fucking great if the big joke and the big build-up to this was that his dad was, like, a Kevin Costner cameo. Uh, <laughs> but, um, so I was thinking we were going in this direction. Um, and, of course, it's Freeman. And the joke is, Ryan Reynolds is white and Freeman is black, and Samuel Jackson notices this and dwells on it. But it turns out he's, like, a step. Um, so that's just dragged out into whatever. Um, I, I will say as far as Freeman goes, and, and, the, and they even build it up when you know it's Freeman, because they, like, have him hiding in the shadows, and we see a silhouette, and we hear his voice, and it's like, we know what Morgan Freeman looks like. We know what the shadow of Morgan Freeman looks like. We know what Morgan Freeman sounds like. So we know what the joke is, but they still keep building it up. Um, but with that said, as far as, like, whether or not Freeman's presence here is wasted or not, um, they do utilize him much more than I was expecting. So there's that, I guess. It's always fun when they don't, you know, completely waste the talent that they get. Um, it's, it reminded me a lot of, um, when I was really afraid they weren't going to use Christopher Lloyd well in Nobody. I thought he was just going to sit there, and that was a really pleasant surprise. Um, so it kind of felt similar to that. So that's, I guess that's another thing it's got going for it, that, uh, Freeman actually gets to do stuff here, believe it or not. So, you know, all right. <laughs> um, but yeah, at the, at the end of the day, though, um, there's a lot of stuff. Like I said, there's a lot of meandering stuff in the middle, especially when they're trying to do comedy, where it's like the dialogue sounds like it's particularly improvised. So it's like e either it's written and sounds improvised, which I guess takes talent, um, or it's just. Reynolds rambling back and forth and Jackson occasionally bouncing off of him and they just put whatever takes in the Apatow approach, basically. Um, which is not good. But, um, the problem, I think, here, as far as Reynolds goes, and I hate to bash him, like, so relentlessly, I know, but, um, like I said at the beginning, I'm tired of doing it, honestly, but the thing here is that I feel like this whole thing would be funnier if some if Reynolds' part was somebody more straight faced, like somebody like somebody who could do comedy, but somebody who's like equally good at being straight faced. And Reynolds is not good with straight face, and I know, uh, but buried, but buried, um, but it's I just can't like full on dead serious Reynolds. I just can't. I've never been able to buy. Um, I said the closest was um, the voices is its own different monster, which is okay. Um, and, maybe, and maybe something like the nines, but uh, f overall, I can't do like serious action hero Reynolds. Um, but I was like, like get somebody who can do comedic and that effectively, and I feel like you would have had more of a balance here. But it's like pretty much everything feels like it's being overrun by this is supposed to feel comedic just based on Reynolds' presence alone, um, which is his own fucking fault. But, but it's, there's, it doesn't feel like there's much of a comedic balance in regards to it wanting to be a full-on action movie, which, like I said, with the energy and the violence of it, um, there's a meshing here that's not quite working with the almost constant comedic feel to it. Like, it's, it feels like there has to be some sort of balance here that Reynolds is not going to be able to get a grasp on, um, because he's, you know, 99% comedic in any place, even if it doesn't call for it, because that's just the reputation that he's built up for himself now. Um, and just that, that way where, like, even in the most serious of moments, like, he, it just feels like he's constantly on the verge of sarcasm, because that's just his thing, and you just, I just can't buy anything. And I, and the thing, the fact that I don't find him funny, I think is what just backs me into a corner with Reynolds, and I just don't know what the fuck to do with him, because <laughs> I don't, because everything he tries to do for me more or less falls flat almost all of the time, and I can't. And so when he's at the center of a movie, I just don't know what how the hell to take it. So I've got to take 
you know, the Samuel Jacksons and the Salma Hayek's and the Antonio Banderas's and the Freemans and see what that can bring to this movie because I'm getting nothing from the Reynolds at all. So, um, that's basically how I feel about this and Ryan Reynolds again. So, and I see that we're, we're just not even close to done with Ryan Reynolds. Anytime soon, he's going to be in uh, Free Guy doing the same thing he always does. He's going to be in that Dwayne Johnson movie doing the same thing he fucking does. Um, they're probably going to do another goddamn Deadpool because we haven't run that shit into the ground after the first movie already. Um, so, yeah. There's all that. So, um, we're going to keep going with this playing more catch-up. We're going to talk about that Chris Pratt movie and whatever the hell else. Um, and see where we end up until, um, like I said, when Friday comes around when we get Space Jam and Escape Room. We'll see if this summer picks up. Uh, maybe we'll get more No Sudden Move type movies. I don't know. Probably not. But, uh, yeah. And then we'll see where we go from there in this sea of sequels that we really don't need. So, uh, until the next thing, I think that's it.